Welcome to this week's Site for White Talking News for Friday the 12th of March 2021. This is Chris reading an article from the Island Observer. Tourists should do the right thing before visiting the Isle of Wight. Taking a to- Covid test is one of the right things tourists should do before visiting the Isle of Wight, according to the Council's Chief Executive. Laid out last week by the Prime Minister, the roadmap to opening the country has caused concerns that the island could see more infections as more tourists visit. The Isle of Wight has already been reaching top spots in searches for holiday destinations as people look to have a summer as normal as possible in staycations close to home. Under the second step of the road map, no earlier than April the 12th, domestic overnight stays in household groups will be allowed and most outdoor activities will be opened. In the third step, and no earlier than May the 17th, overnight stays will be open for all with international travel subject to review. It is also the stage where indoor hospitality, entertainment and attractions can open. Speaking at a meeting of the Isle of Wight Council's Health and Social Care Scrutiny Committee, Councillor Michael Lilly said, while the island's economy is very linked to visitors, due to the spike of cases over Christmas, people are worried it will happen again. The Isle of Wight Council's Chief Executive, John Metcalfe, said being a year into the pandemic, now the Council has very effective tools available to help protect the island and its community. But that does not mean there is not more we can do and more options will be looked at. Mr Metcalf said there had been a good compliance from a great majority of businesses following guidelines, but COVID support officers will be providing practical advice to businesses about what they can and cannot do. He also said the council is working with tourism body, Visit Isle of Wight, to get messages to businesses and also marketing and promoting the island while advising people to do the right things before they visit. Through public health powers, if an outbreak is in a particular area, Mr Metcalf said they are able to take action and have now built up a localised test and tracing team to contact people quicker and ultimately prevent further spread faster. Simon Bryant, Director of Public Health, said easing out of lockdown and following the roadmap will need to be managed really carefully, as some forecast modelling outcomes had shown there could be an increase in cases. This is Brian reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press. A waste of our time. Fire service called to teenagers trapped in baby swings. Emergency services have labelled a call out on Tuesday evening a waste of our time after three teenagers became stuck in baby swings in a park in Cowes. Fire control received a 999 call to assist the three teenagers and were obliged to attend the scene for humanitarian reasons. A spokesperson for the Isle of Wight Fire Service said a crew from Cowes were called to the scene in Park Road shortly after 6pm after three teenagers had phoned to report a situation where they were stuck in baby swings. They stayed a little while to ensure the swings were sorted out. A subsequent tweet said 
Though obliged to attend for humanitarian reasons, this is a waste of our time and resources and a cost to the community. The teenagers should have been at home. Isle of Wight NHS staff survey reveals positives. From Isle of Wight Radio. Iona. The latest Isle of Wight NHS Trust staff survey has revealed an improvement in the quality of care, safety, culture and the health and well-being support on offer to staff. The latest results published today on Thursday show that morale and staff engagement are improving, with more people recommending the Trust as a place to work, along with an increase in the number of staff happy with the standard of care provided. Areas of the Trust that are setting the bar nationally, with the ambulance service recording some of the best results in the country, scoring highest in its category for 8 out of 10 key themes. The national survey, which happened in autumn 2020, saw a record 60% of staff, or nearly 2,000 people, share their views on a range of topics from line management to clinical practice. Overall, the Trust has seen improvements across its workforce in six key areas. Quality of care, safety culture, safe environment, bullying and harassment, health and well-being, staff engagement and morale. The results show that more staff are happy with the standard of care provided and would be happy for friends and families, if needed, to be cared for by our teams, by the teams at the NHS. Director of People and Organisational Development, Julie Pennycock, Pennycook, said, This is great news for our island community as we see feedback on our quality of care and friends and family test improving. We've seen a 15% rise in the number of staff who would recommend the Trust as a place to work. This is encouraging news as the health and happiness of our team members is a priority for us. The people who work at our Trust have told us that things are improving and as we continue on our getting to good journey, we will act on their feedback and make sure that they continue to be supported to provide the best possible care to our community. There is a lot of work to do to sustain this improvement and working with our partners will help make sure our services and staff and patient experiences keep getting better. The survey also highlighted several areas for improvement, including how the Trust involves staff in decision-making, how teams discuss their effectiveness and people's experience of violence in the workplace. Isle of Wight NHS Trust Chief Executive Maggie Oldham said, More people than ever have had their say in the latest staff survey and these positive results show the progress we are making as a Trust, even as we respond to the challenges of coronavirus. Making sure people are happy and healthy at work is crucial to providing the high quality, compassionate care we strive for. So it's fantastic to see that our staff feel better supported and that morale is improved. People in our team make a positive difference every day and they are a credit to our Trust and I'd like to thank them for all their hard work. The wonderful support of our island community has meant so much of us during the last year meant so much to us during the last year and I'm sure that it's helped people through some difficult months so thank you again for all your support. This is Michael reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press. Island Roads says it hopes to finish the first stage of its work to upgrade York Avenue in East Cowes on time despite damage to a water service pipe. The contractor wrote to residents to warn it had been hindered by a combination of poor groundwork, shallow services and heavy showers after week one of the first phase of the project. However, town councillors posted on social media to say a water pipe had been damaged, resulting in a call to Southern Water. Island Roads told the county press, in the early stages of work, an old, unused but nevertheless live water service pipe was unfortunately damaged. We were, however, able to work elsewhere on the site while the leak was repaired. While this incident did cause a small delay, the main challenge on site, as stated, has been the depth of excavation required due to the ground conditions. As per our update to residents, we are still aiming to complete this phase, as scheduled, by March the 23rd. Island Roads has thanked people living nearby for their support and cooperation. Teams are carrying out months of work on the main and only route into Cowles. Traffic is diverting via Beatrice Avenue. Over four phases, around 3,000 square metres of road will be dug up, 
to a depth of over two feet. Work will take around 64 days, with six nights split into two phases for reconstruction. Resurfacing is currently scheduled for June the 2nd to the 9th. However, it is hoped the road will be temporarily fully open for the May bank holiday. This is Petrina reading an article from Isle of Wight County Press. The Isle of Wight's MP is investigating concerns about dredging off Sandown Bay. Bob Seeley has written to the Crown Estate, which is responsible for granting dredging licences. Mr Seeley wants reassurance that coastal erosion around the island is not linked to marine aggregate dredging collecting stones from the seabed for use elsewhere. There have been reports that sand is being eroded at Sandown and Shanklin, amongst the island's most popular beaches and tourist hotspots. Locally, in the Bay Area, a task force has also been set to look into the allegations. Mr Seeley is also worried about the impact dredging could have on the island's marine conservation zones. Mr Seeley said, I am told that this is an approved marine aggregate dredging, but I am checking what that means in terms of impact assessments that have been undertaken prior to work commencing. I know residents are concerned that the work might be impacting on the beach so I'm seeking reassurance that this is not the case. Licences are only granted after a regulator and scientific assessors have reviewed the potential impact of dredging, which sees parts of the seabed collected for use elsewhere. Calling it a concern, Mr Seeley said many would welcome further assurance from the Crown Estate that it is environmentally safe. Hello, this is Steve reading a story from the Isle of Wight County Press, Hydeland. Council blasted for failing to investigate children's services complaint properly. The local government and social care ombudsman has criticised the Isle of Wight Council for failing to properly investigate a mother's complaint about the way it removed her disabled son's personal budget. The ombudsman's investigation found the council did not follow procedures set out in law for dealing with complaints about children's services, and by the time the Ombudsman had become involved, the Council had delayed the woman's complaint by more than a year. The mother's complaint centred on the Council deciding to stop the money she received as a personal budget for her son, who has complex needs, because it said she was not spending the money in line with their agreement. After being unhappy with the Council's initial response, the mother asked the council no less than four times to escalate her complaint to stage two of the three-stage statutory children's complaints procedure. Each time she asked for her complaint to be escalated, the council decided her dissatisfaction was about a separate issue and was a new complaint. But her complaint was about the same issue throughout, and any new issues were the result of the council's failure to investigate her complaint correctly. The mother sought help from a solicitor, to try to get the council to escalate her complaint. The council then told her she needed to meet certain criteria before it would be progressed. As part of the Ombudsman's investigation, it became apparent other people on the island had also not had their complaints properly considered through the statutory process. Michael King, the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman, has said, Statutory guidance says councils must progress complaints through all three stages of children's complaints procedure if that is what the person wants. By putting barriers and conditions on the mother's complaint and insisting she was making new complaints even when they covered the same issues, the council was, in effect, gatekeeping and preventing her from accessing her statutory rights. I'm pleased the council has accepted my recommendations and hope the training and procedural changes it has agreed to make will ensure other complaints are handled properly in future. I will be issuing new guidance to local authorities shortly to clarify how I expect them to tackle children's complaints. The Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman's role is to remedy injustice and share learning from investigations to help improve public and adult social care services. 
In this case, the council has agreed to apologise to the family and pay the son £100 to acknowledge he did not have access to a service he was entitled to for two months. It will also pay the mum £300 to acknowledge the uncertainty and distress caused and £500 to acknowledge the time and trouble caused by not escalating her complaint to stage two. The Ombudsman has the power to make recommendations to improve processes for the wider public. In this case, the Council has agreed to review its procedures for personal budgets and to develop a procedure to respond to concerns about how a payee is using or managing a personal budget. The Isle of Wight Council has also agreed to provide all staff training on the statutory complaint procedure and task a senior officer not previously involved to contact all complainants that were refused a stage 2 or stage 3 complaint and ensure each refusal complied with statutory guidance. If any do not, it should take steps to reopen those complaint investigations and progress to the next stage if the complainant wishes. This is Chris reading an article from the Island Echo. Brigadier Maurice Sheen appointed new Vice Lord Lieutenant. With the approval of Her Majesty the Queen, Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant of the Isle of Wight, Mrs Susie Sheldon, JP, has appointed a new Vice Lord Lieutenant. Brigadier Maurice Sheen, CBE, QVRM, TD, DL will succeed Lieutenant Colonel Sir Guy Ackland, Baronet, LVO, DL, when he retires on the 24th of March this year. Morris was born, educated and grew up in Carisbrook and gained two degrees before joining the teaching profession. For 39 years, he served full and part-time in the British Army, in the UK, Germany, the Gulf region and the Balkans. In particular, working closely with the Officer Corps of fledgling armies, he led British military teams that re-established the Iraqi Military Academy in 2005 and established the Afghan National Army Officers Academy in 2013. In addition to being invested with the Queen's Volunteer Reserve Medal, Morris was unusually honoured by the award of the United States Bronze Star for his work in Iraq and was created CBE for his service in Afghanistan. He lives in Totland and amongst several voluntary activities, he is currently the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Chair of South East Reserve Forces and Cadets Association, also County Chair of St John's Ambulance, a member of the Deanery Synod and a volunteer at Osborne House. Mr Sheen has said, I am both humbled and honoured by this opportunity to serve the diverse community of the island, a place of great beauty and a place that, wherever I have served in the world, has always been my real home. If I can do half as good a job as Sir Guy, who has served the island with great distinction over many years, I shall be a very happy man. This is Brian reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press. Isle of Wight urged to stub out this no smoking day. The Isle of Wight Council is encouraging Islanders to find out how they can give up smoking for good this no smoking day. Simon Bryant, Director of Public Health at the Isle of Wight Council, has spoken of the benefits of quitting ahead of the 37th National No Smoking Day on the 10th of March. He said, this last year has been very difficult and stressful for many of us, but the good news is that smokers who quit for six weeks or more are happier and experience less anxiety and depression 
than those who carry on smoking. While giving up smoking for good may sound daunting, evidence shows you are more likely to succeed with the help of a stop smoking service than if you try to quit by yourself. Healthy Lifestyles Isle of Wight, the council funded stop smoking service offers practical solutions including switching to e-cigarettes, support online by telephone or via an app to help you quit in a way that suits you. The number of smokers on the island is around 14%, which is about 16,800 people and remains slightly higher than the national average. As well as offering information and advice, Healthy Lifestyles Isle of Wight can help with stop smoking aids, including nicotine replacement therapy, such as patches, gum or inhalers, prescription only stop smoking medicines and e-cigarettes or vapes. Combining stop smoking aids with expert help means people are three times as likely to quit as using willpower alone. For further information on stop smoking support for island residents, visit Healthy Lifestyles Isle of Wight. Southampton Airport expansion, Isle of Wight Council leader backs controversial plans. From Isle of Wight Radio, Iona. The Isle of Wight Council leader has thrown his support behind controversial plans to expand Southampton Airport. Councillor Dave Stewart says he and his Cabinet colleagues back the important proposals due to the importance of the airport to the local Hampshire and Isle of Wight economy. He also said he recognises the importance of regional air travel as a potential catalyst for greener travel as a whole. The airport wants to lengthen the runway by 164 metres. It is hoped doing so would accommodate larger planes and increase the number of flights. Commenting on the application to Eastleigh Borough Council, Councillor Stewart said the plans are critical to the future of Southampton Airport as a viable regional airport. And he said... Its loss would be enormously detrimental to the the local area in terms of direct and indirect impact on jobs and the associated supply chain and on the economic competitiveness of the area. I am, of course, conscious of the environmental challenges that such a development can bring and would therefore support any opportunity for securing climate change improvements through this development. Extinction Rebellion Isle of Wight has written to the council leader to express its concerns. It said the council's support threatens the health and lives of the people of Southampton and the Isle of Wight. And it said... The island has and will continue to experience air pollution from our neighbouring big cities of Portsmouth and Southampton. The amount of air pollution varies based on its wind direction and speed, but it exists. This transboundary pollution is what affects the whole of Europe and can certainly affect us on the island. Airport expansion also brings an increase in pollution at low level, reducing air quality further in the vicinity of the airport and to the city. A decision on proposals to extend the runway has been delayed. This is Michael reading an article from the Isle of Wight County Press. A woman in the process of renovating her new Shanklin home made a startling discovery earlier this week as, contrary to traditional wisdom, breaking a mirror proved a good omen. Emily Davis, along with her husband Daniel, recently returned to the Isle of Wight. She was getting a head start on the work while Daniel, a petty officer in the Royal Navy, was away at sea. After breaking the mirror at the top of their stairs, she discovered several pages of a 121-year-old copy of the County Press, dated January the 27th, 1900. Emily said, My husband and I have recently moved back to the island and purchased our new house in Shanklin. There was a mirror fixed to the wall, and the only way to get it off was to unfortunately break it up, at which point I discovered the newspaper and couldn't believe the date on it at first. It's fascinating to read, and there are many family names mentioned I recognise as still being island family names today. We intend to preserve it 
as best we can and keep it as a memento of times gone by with the house. This is Petrina reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. A peaceful protest took place in a leafy Bembridge Lane earlier this week as residents subject to holiday lodges on protected woodland. Protesters feel utility work being undertaken to prepare the site are premature as no planning permission has been granted. Plans have been submitted to the Isle of Wight Council for two one-bed holiday lodges on woodland off Love Lane in Brembridge. The company behind the application, Love Lane Isle of Wight, say the lodges, which have been designed to fit in with the woodland setting, clad in timber and with living moss roofs, would appeal to couple on a walking holiday. Planning agent Martha James said in documents the site had fallen into neglect and needed gentle management for the woodland to be sustainable in the future. Permission has been granted to remove and replace six dead trees. This was needed as the site has been given a woodland protection order. According to residents, they have so far been removed, but not replaced. On Monday, protesters gathered at the site to object to work being done on the site preemptively. Police were called to the gathering of about 20 people by the landowners. One of the protesters, former Island High Sheriff Peter Grimbali, who lives in Love Lane, said that the developers were causing chaos before planning permission has been granted. While the work can legally go ahead, Mr Grimaldi said residents are concerned about the effect this will have on the woodland in the future, should planning permission not be given. He said further work was done on the site yesterday, Tuesday, when engineers reinstalled electric boxes after they had been removed from someone else's property and later in the month a water main is scheduled to be installed. So far 110 objections to the lodges have been submitted by residents. The island's MP Bob Seeley said he found it outrageous anyone would even think about building on woodland and it should be left well alone. At a meeting of Bembridge Parish Council's planning committee yesterday, councillors unanimously agreed to strongly object as it went against 11 policies in the Bembridge Neighbourhood Development Plan. Chair of the planning committee, Councillor Marianne Sullivan, said, We are going to have to concern ourselves with climate change now and very urgently in the immediate future. Why on earth would we think it was a good idea? I hate this scheme. Isle of Wight councillor Michael Merwill is also objecting and said the woodland was a key natural place of beauty and he hoped planning officers would make the right decision. In a preliminary ecological appraisal, Surveyor said that without any mitigation measures the development would have an adverse effect on the woodland's wildlife. Birds, badgers, bats, dormice, hedgehogs and red squirrels. Applications had previously been submitted by the former owner of the land, both times failing to get permission and then failing to overturn the decision by the planning inspectorate. To view or comment on the application, 21 stroke 00224 stroke FUL via the Isle of Wight Council's planning register. Comments can be made until March the 19th. Hello, this is Steve reading a story from Isle of Wight Radio, headlined Coronavirus, More Children Being Homeschooled on Isle of Wight. COVID-19 has seen an increased number of children being homeschooled on the Isle of Wight this year. Compared to last year's autumn term, figures show the number of those being home-educated has risen by 21%. In a report about elective home education, which went before the Isle of Wight Council's Children's Education Scrutiny Committee, 
464 young people were registered as being taught at home at the end of December last year, compared to 384 pupils the year before. The island has always had a relatively high number of children being home educated compared to other local authority areas, with the current numbers equating to 3.1% of the total school age population. Between September and December last year, 159 children started to be home educated, which council officers say appears to have been influenced by COVID-19. In reasons given for home educating their children, the highest factor was COVID-19. 38 parents said the virus was the cause of their decision, saying it was because of shielding family members, anxiety, and not liking the restrictions placed on schools for the basis. Where COVID-19 was given as the reason for home education, the majority of pupils, that's 31, were primary school aged. Other reasons parents gave for home educating their child included emotional and physical, that's 31 cases, cultural, philosophical and religious, that's 20 cases, and bullying, 4 cases. In some cases, no reason had been given. Numbers could continue to rise, officers say as schools start to reopen for the spring term. The Council's Inclusion Support Service Manager Dave Harvey said some parents and children may have enjoyed the homeschooling experience and would continue to electively home educate, which was their legal right if they chose to. He said, I suspect, however, most parents, of the increased number, will want to eventually send their children back when they are happy that schools are safe and they feel it is the right thing to do. Mr Harvey also said the council would be speaking to schools about how best to support returning children. This is Chris, reading an item from Isle of Wight Radio. E-scooters clock up 7,000 journeys on the Isle of Wight. More than 7,000 journeys have been made on e-scooters on the Isle of Wight since their introduction in November travelling a total of 571 times around the island. Not all people have been accepting of the new scheme, with the Isle of Wight Council saying it has been receiving a few complaints. Councillor Ian Ward, Council Cabinet Member for Infrastructure and Transport, said the scooters were introduced around the time people were buying private ones and people were unable to tell the difference between the two. He said, It seemed like a lot of complaints at the time, but it has all died away now. There is very little feedback from the public, but it was a bit hairy at the beginning. It was something new that people weren't used to so looked for reasons we shouldn't do it. The novelty has worn off now and you are probably only getting the serious user. In total, almost 40,000 miles have been travelled on the e-scooters, with 90% of journeys finishing in the allocated bays. The launch started with 25 e-scooters in Newport and has now expanded to ride, cows and east cows with a total of 99 scooters. The numbers of the for hire e-scooters is expected to rise to 150. Despite initial concerns the vehicles would be damaged the numbers are said to be very low. Rider corridors have been implemented on the main routes in and between towns and if riders stray off the routes, the scooters will slow down and eventually stop. This is Brian reading an item from Isle of Wight Radio. Isle of Wight's Amazon World welcomes Baby Saki Monkey. There's a new addition to the Amazon World family. The zoo's white-faced Saki Monkeys Mr. Saki and Gracie have had a baby. Mum Gracie gave birth in the early hours of Sunday 7th of March and keepers say she has been tightly clinging onto her for the last month. Native to the forests of northern Brazil, 
French Guiana, Guyana, Suriname and Venezuela, white-faced Saki monkey's habitat is under threat due to deforestation. While this species isn't currently endangered, staff say it's important to have a captive population due to the risk of extinction in the wild. Council U-turn over Newport taxi rank relocation from Isle of Wight Radio. Iona. The Isle of Wight Council has backtracked on plans to temporarily move Newport's taxi operators to St James's Street. Taxis will now be moved to within Church Lytton Car Park instead. As part of the upcoming works to St George's Way, the council had planned on relocating drivers from South Street to St James's Street. It was to allow buses, which had been displaced by the need to use Church Lytton as a free-flowing diversion route, to move the rank outside Peacocks. The current taxi rank outside Morrison's is also required to facilitate the one-way diversion route. The move was greeted with backlash by a number of the island's cabbies, who claimed there was no consultation and said the space at St James's Street was not suitable for disabled passengers. The council has now revised plans, Councillor Ian Ward, Cabinet Member for Transport and Infrastructure, said. In such circumstances, there is never an ideal solution and we explored alternative options for the locations, location of the taxi ranks. Multiple alternative locations were considered, including behind the library in Orchard Street, in Pyle Street and in Lower High Street. However, the options were limited, practically by the one-way orders and traffic movement restrictions within the town and the requirement for taxis to be able to travel in all directions. We were of the view that on balance, the sitting of the temporary rank in nearby St James's Street was the best option in all circumstances. However, we were happy to listen and take on board the views of local taxi operators and members. When the easing of COVID-19 restrictions allow, the council says Southern Vectors will return to the site. The scheme to widen St George's Way is the latest phase of ongoing investment to reduce congestion in and around Newport. While access to and from furlongs will generally be available during the project, there will be periods when access will be restricted to allow works to take place across the junction. The first planned closure of the exit from furlongs to St George's Way is from Monday the 15th for two to three days. Hello, this is Steve reading a story from the On The White online news site, headlined Isle of Wight Council Acts Smart to Save Money at Upcoming Elections. The 6th of May is polling day for not only the Isle of Wight Council, but also town, parish and community council elections, plus the Police and Crime Commissioner. Here's how the Isle of Wight Council plans to save £44,000. As well as Isle of Wight Council elections, there will be town, parish and community council elections plus polling for the Police and Crime Commissioner, that's the PCC. It's because of the PCC elections that the council are starting their pre-election period, also known as PERDA, on 22nd of March rather than the official deadline date of 29th of March. By deciding to issue the notice of election on the same day as the police area returning officer, the Isle of Wight will be saving £44,000 in unnecessary postage costs. An Isle of Wight council spokesperson explains. Our local elections are combined with those for the Hampshire Police and Crime Commissioner, that's the PCC, as well as the parish, town and community councils on the Isle of Wight. The police area returning officer is publishing their notice of election, which starts the election process on Monday 22nd of March. We could publish your notice of election later, up to the 29th of March. However, as there is a requirement to issue poll cards as soon as practicable after the publication of the notice of election, we would be required to send the PCC poll cards out as soon as practicable on or after the 22nd of March and then wait until the notice of election was published for the local elections before sending out a second batch of poll cards for the Isle of Wight Council and parish, town and community council elections. This would be potentially confusing for electors, and the cost of printing and posting a full second batch of poll cards is around £44,000. Publishing the notice of election earlier also allows more time for nominations to be received. This longer period will hopefully reduce the numbers of candidates who wish to submit their nomination papers at the same time. Plans to demolish former Shanklin Hotel in favour of flats. 
from Isle of Wight Radio. Iona. A former hotel in Shanklin could be pulled down and replaced with two two four-storey blocks of flats. Queensmead Hotel on Queens Road, Shanklin, was closed in October 2020, and now plans have been submitted to demolish the 23-bed hotel, buildings and swimming pool. In its place, two blocks would be built, forming 18 flats, a mixture of one and two beds with car and bicycle parking spaces. Applicants Mr and Mrs B Audley have submitted outlined plans to the Isle of Wight Council. The appearance and the landscaping of the site will be a subject of a future application. Plans from the agents, MJ Hales Architectural Service, show one block of flats will front Queen's Road and the other will face Alexandra Road. The first building will have ten two-bed flats, one being a penthouse with lift access. The second would be eight houses, eight residents, six two-bed apartments, three of those being over two floors and two one-bed flats. Island Roads has said it approves conditionally to the major development. Hello, this is Lisa, CEO of Site for White, welcoming you to this week's Talking News. This week, I got a chance to look back at our records, and I'm delighted to say that compared to this time last year, we're now receiving five times more phone calls and helping 17 times more members per week with individual queries. We are really pleased that people are picking up the phone and asking for help when they need it. These can be big questions like looking into purchasing digital equipment, which can cost several thousand pounds. Or it can be, do we have any advice on which brand of food labels are easiest to read? Both equally important to the end user and we're delighted to be able to help with both. On Tuesday evening, Debbie drew her Mother's Day pamper hamper. And the lucky winner, Joyce, was in receipt of the hamper, which contained a bottle of Lansom champagne, Lindt chocolates, two DVDs with popcorn to watch and a head-to-toe pamper kit, which included lotions and potions for a full home spa. Congratulations, Joyce. Also this week, our site for white Easter chicks are literally flying out the door. We've asked members and volunteers who've expressed an interest in knitting previously to knit our lovely little yellow chicks. And then we put a Cadbury's cream egg inside the chick and bag them up individually so that each little chick can be sold on. We're delighted to be able to have to go back to the the members and volunteers to ask for more chicks. Remember, these can be collected from Millbrook House or we can post them out in larger quantities if you need us to. Finally, this week, we have started to make plans with hopefully being able to reopen after the lockdown has fully been lifted. At the moment, this is the planned date of the 21st of June. But of course, we will keep a careful eye on any new announcements as they are made. Stay safe and thank you for listening to Sight for White's Talking News. Scaffolding News, week commencing the 15th of March. Totland area. Totty's Fish and Chips, the Broadway. Ride area, 51 George Street. Newport area. 25 and 27 Lugley Street. Outside Hellesy's Fabric, Lugley Street. 41 High Street. 3 Castle Hold Lane, Halifax High Street. Sandown area. Trevelli Hotel, Sandown Esplanade. Corkheads Restaurant, Avenue Road. Flat C, St George's Hall. Shanklin area, Rio's Burgers, 9 Regent Street. Cows area, 14 to 15 Shooters Hill. 31 Mill Hill Road, Yarmouth area, Grove Cottage, St James's Street. Only one skip this week. The Yarmouth area, outside on the rocks, Bridge Road. Site for White would like to thank you for listening to this week's edition of the Talking News. We would also like to thank our volunteers for reading and a particular thank you to the Isle of Wight County Press, Isle of Wight Observer, On the White, Island Echo, Isle of Wight Radio 
and a special thank you to Vectis Radio.